Coming up on Tech News Today, everybody's getting into tablets. Looks like we have a little insight into what HP's WebOS tablet might look like. Microsoft might have a new version of Windows meant specifically for tablets. And in non-tablet news, the Film On guy has a crazy rant against CBS, which we'll try to interpret next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Tuesday, December 21st, 2010. Tech News Today is brought to you by Slingbox, which just turned your iPad into a television. Slingbox introduces their new iPad app just in time for the holidays. So now you can watch your home TV on your iPad anywhere you take it. Check it out at Best Buy or Slingbox.com. And by MailRoute.info. MailRoute is a secure hosted service that provides enterprise-grade virus and spam filtering to companies of any size. Try it right now, absolutely free, at MailRoute.info. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I am Becky Orley. And I'm Jason Howell. Joining us today from across the waters, Mr. Patrick Beja, tech uh, correspondent for La Rendezvous Tech, uh, owner Absolutely. of PatrickBeja.com. Ooh, that's a hot URL right there. <laughs> owner of <laughs> FrenchSpin.com. And participant in NoWatch.net, which has lots of cool podcasts. How are you doing, guys? Good, good. It's glad, I'm yeah. glad to have you back here. Happy solstice. Ooh. Thank right. you. Happy solstice to I know, you too. I this know. is a a widely celebrated uh, 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 party fest thing in our socialist countries. So right, in, I'm in, glad you, you in pagan mention. godless Europe. Uh, <laughs> I hear Saturnalia is a uh, is a rather fun time. You you switch roles with your servants. I'm told, uh, John like <laughs> or so John they say. Uh, and you know it's just a, it's a fun time for everyone. So in a joyous season to you. I think it's celebrate. just the shortest Thank day you. of the year, so people have to, you know, watch podcasts and just do things inside the house. So that's why I think we should be celebrating it. They got to watch us. <laughs> I think we should re rechristen it, uh, as it were, Podcast Day. Yeah, yes. that should be podcast. Although Agreed. many will remember it as net neutrality, Miss. After uh, <laughs> this morning's vote by the FCC to pass, they voted three-two right along party lines. Uh, Chairman Julius Janikowski and the two Democratic commissioners voted yes on the basic internet values framework. Oh, uh, awesome. So they passed net neutrality legislation. This is great, right? The two Republicans uh, uh. voted no. Uh, this means that uh, wireless internet remains totally uh, without any kind of rules whatsoever. Although the commissioner was quick to say the fact that we haven't passed any rules doesn't mean you can do whatever you want. Uh, it also uh, bans content blocking although there are some loopholes for that, uh, requires transparency from all ISPs, inc including wireless, uh, and they also require network, uh, network management and packet discrimination to be reasonable. Uh, oh, actually, I, I should I take that back. Wireless broadband is, expen is ex exempt from everything but the transparency and blocking rules, so they can't block content on wireless broadband either. Uh, so can you synopsize this by saying that you have to tell people what you're doing, and you can't block legal content. Well, so, okay. The, Let's start with the FCC has not demonstrated any further de uh, reason why they are able to put in place these regulations. They've wa lost one co court case with Comcast. So we don't know that these guidelines have any teeth whatsoever. Uh, well, the, the general counsel for the FCC said that it comes from the 1996 Telecommunications Act. She said that today, which says the FCC has the authority and discretion to settle on the best regulatory or deregulatory approach to broadband. And I don't know if it's a she or he, Austin Schlick. Um, so they're trying to assert their, their control, but you're not feeling that, Tom? Uh, this just, uh, first of all, we're not sure. Th these are all going to end up in court if, if they're ever enforced. Uh, none of these things are anything that would have caused an enforcement in the past. So we're not, I'm not sure that they're fixing anything, if anything is wrong to begin with. Uh, and they're essentially toothless. Networks can, can do whatever they want and claim that it was reasonable and say, and challenge them to take the court. So I, I feel like this was just worthless uh, legislation. It doesn't do anything to avoid the real problems 
of monopoly. And to, to me, that's what the net neutrality debate is all about. Net neutrality shouldn't be imposed. Net neutrality should evolve naturally, like it does on the backbone, from competition. We have a little bit of competition in wireless, but we have almost no competition in wireline here in the United States. Uh, well, perhaps there should be antitrust regulation put in place <laughs> against, against companies, but this doesn't do anything to give me more choices when an ISP decides to do something I don't like. I'm stuck with my cable company or a slower telephone company for my, my two choices for Internet if I want to get a, a landline Internet. Which means you actually do need regulation. I'm sorry to be the token socialist here, but it really irks me when people say, yeah, we all hate it when the government comes in and says we need regulation and the government can't regulate, you know, and can't, doesn't know its, heads from it, its, its head from its tail. But in this case, like in a few others, I'm sure every reasonable person on the planet will agree you do need regulation because what everyone is saying is, we don't need regulation if we have competition. But here, we don't have competition, and, you know, uh, you sort of muddy around the issue and say you still don't really need regulation. Let's come out in clear and, and strong, uh, a strong message saying, in this case, net neutrality is way too important, and we do, need, we do need someone of authority to say you cannot mess with it. Because what everyone is saying is this is not a, a this is sort of a toothless uh, uh, set of rules, but it's not just a toothless set of rules that cannot be enforced. You're right. It's, it's a lot mouthless. more than this. It's <laughs> well, it's 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 really saying you cannot, you know, you, you it's, it's enforcing rules for sort of the wired internet, but it's saying all of this doesn't really apply to the wireless internet. So in effect, it does say you, the the wireless internet is sort of a free for all, kind of, with being very uh, dangerous, setting a very dangerous precedent. Well, Julius Janikowski said that wireless was too nascent to put these um, rules and regulations or any rules and regulations on it. And I think this is what's interesting about his attempt to find a compromise, which is pleasing no one. And there are a lot of people who think this is far too invasive. So let me read you some of the reactions that are coming in. Uh, Senator Mitch McConnell, this will harm investment, stifle innovation and lead to job losses. Um, Republican Commissioner on the FCC, Robert McDowell. The FCC has gone off the rails, becoming a regulatory vigilante. Uh, vigilante, they've provocatively charted a collision course with the legislative branch. Verizon, this one I want your opinion on, Tom, because they have made this assertion that there's going to be a lot of legislation around this, too. They say in a statement, this assertion of authority without solid statutory underpinnings will yield continued uncertainty for industry, innovators, and investors. Uh, summary, basically, they think there's going to be a lawsuit here. Do you think this is all going to end up in court and it's meaningless? Uh, I, I think if the FCC does something, it will immediately end up in court. Anytime, if the FCC makes any move to enforce any of these guidelines, they're going to be taken to court immediately. I also know that the House of Representatives, as soon as the new House is inducted in January, are going to move to try to squash this uh, and take the power of the FCC away. Uh, so I, I really don't think that these rules are going to kill innovation. I think all this rhetoric is just theatrical nonsense that somehow it's going to stifle innovation. I think the abusive monopolistic practices of companies who have taken government money to drive out any competition and hold down the ability to develop Internet and keep our bandwidth as one of the slowest in the world have stifled innovation quite well on their own. And they don't need the FCC's help. This isn't going to change anything for positive or for ill. Yeah, and I think that there are two points there. One, that at least the FCC has tried to claim its stake. They've fired the first salvo and they've laid the groundwork for saying, okay, we are at least going to start this process and it may end up in a, in the legislative decision process, but we are going to take ownership of this and start it. And, you know, I gave you some of the real dissenting opinions on this, um, on this, I don't know, what are we even calling this? The net neutrality rules? Is it, it's not a law, it's a ruling. Guidelines. Yeah. Guidelines. But I wanted to read what Steve Wozniak said because it very much supports what you just said, um, Tom, he wrote a letter and said, I don't want to feel that whatever content, whichever content supplier had the best government connections or paid the most money determined what I can watch and for how much. This is the monopolistic approach and it's not representative of a truly free market in the case of today's internet. So we've got this real schism where some people feel like these new rules and guidelines have are stifling innovation, they're stifling the free market. And then you've got the other side saying, this isn't enough to keep the internet free 
and the free market is just a facade anyways. So I think really at least we've moved the issue forward, even if this is not anywhere near resolution. I don't even think I, I'd, I'd even I, I don't even know if not. I agree that they've moved the issue forward. I think they've. Yeah, I could not disagree water. more with with what you've been saying you're i understand that you're you are all trying to you know you're all re respectable journalists and you're trying to see both sides of the issue but <laughs> i don't understand how this can be any more clear first of all there is no basis whatsoever for claiming that th this will stifle innovation just as uh, thomas said this is not supported by any ki kind of reasoning ever it's just saying like you know i could claim that this will turn the sky red it would have just as much validity. And the other side of it is, yes, maybe the FCC is trying to do something. It's sort of, you know, you're encouraging your child to, to take his first steps. That's not the, the issue. The net neutrality is an extremely important principle that is detailed in one simple sentence. You cannot discriminate data at all whatsoever in any way. Well, and that's, taking it, too, that that's taking it too far, Patrick. You need to be able to manage your data. That's why I have a problem with these guidelines, even as toothless as they are, is that they actually point towards making it worse eventually by trying to tell networks how they can manage their data. You have to be able to what, prioritize. Why do you need to manage data? You have to data. be able to, to provide quality of service. You have to be able to do data prioritization if you want to have actual good service for everyone on your network. Once you get a government agency starting to tell a network, this is what data you have to pass along and, and this is what you can't it's going to hurt the way they ne they manage networks this doesn't do that because this doesn't do hardly anything but and what we need is not the fcc getting in the business of being a system administrator what we need well, is is someone saying look there needs to be competition there needs to be choice and maybe there needs to be uh, a limitation on what companies can own the pipes and an opening up of the pipes to competition so that other isps yeah, can use them Tom, and manage the networks however they want Again, you're going to competition, which I agree is the only true way of keeping things clean in that environment. But this is not going to happen. Again, it's like saying we would all need to be riding unicorns. It's not going to happen. So That's in this true. real setting, it's very easy. You, you think they we are it, eventually going to be riding unicorns? I do. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, to say that there'll never be competition, I think, is a little fatuous. That's all. Well, well, it's it's, it's a first US. it's a first step. We're gonna be it's it's no we socialized this unicorns. Would be, we were hoping this would be some sort of summary summation. Let's move on. Let's not worry about net neutrality anymore. Oh no, this is just step one on a long journey. Yeah, I think that's what bothers me the most is this just really didn't do anything <laughs> except get everyone mad. Which I, I guess you can make the argument is if you've got both sides mad, maybe you're doing the right thing. But I just think you're in the, in this case you're not doing anything. What bothers me is that you guys are not more angry. Net neutrality and the, the internet is our legacy. This generation's gift to the world and we are risking losing it. You should be more angry. Be angry. This is the <laughs> angriest I've been in weeks. <laughs> this is Tom fired up. What are you talking about, dude? He's like having a roid rage and you didn't even notice. <laughs> That's the problem. <laughs> All right. Uh, HP Slate-like WebOS tablets coming to CES. That's uh, according to a report on Engadget. They're passing it along uh, from a few different sources. Fox News broke it first, I think. Our, our, our friend of the show, Clayton Morris, broke it first. Uh, there are some drawings of, frankly, what looked to me just like the Windows 7 HP Slate. So a lot of people are saying, well, this obviously is just the HP, the original HP Slate, and they slapped WebOS on it. How do we know this is real? Uh, to me, I, that, that could make it real or not real. It could be that they're just repurposing that design and putting WebOS on it with a uh, with an HP Palm Pad dock. Uh, Which Engadget points out would be nutty because that would just be bizarre for the battery life on the device. And why bother just doing that and not doing a visual refresh on the design? It just doesn't make sense. Well, it does, the story does say that there would be three different types. So I guess the other types might be more different than the, the Windows 7 tablet. Um, anyway, mm -hmm. uh, interesting to know, we will probably get a look at the, the HP WebOS tablet, which is the, the next latest thing that will save palm Dublin down baby Dublin down anybody <laughs> excited about that the kids I'm not, I'm wish, oh, I wish I could be more optimistic yeah uh, sadly no <laughs> <laughs> All right, we got, a, we got a triplet of Microsoft stories here uh, that are pretty interesting. Uh, Bloomberg reporting that Microsoft is going to unveil a version of Windows created for ARM 
processors. And a lot of people are interpreting this to mean that Microsoft will be going directly after the iPad with their own sort of version of a tablet operating system based on their main operating system. I guess the way Apple says that OS X has been simplified and turned into iOS for the phones and tablets, uh, this is uh, different than Windows Embedded Compact 7, according to the stories I'm reading. Um, the version will be able to run on x86, Hitachi Super H, and MIPS in addition to ARM. Uh, so... I, I, what, I don't know. What do you th what do you all think? Is is Microsoft uh, bringing out a new Windows tablet operating system here, or well, is this a bunch well, of? Let's movies? look at the numbers. They have to be doing something. So one analyst said that there are going to be 50 million tablets sold next year, and his estimate is that Microsoft could get between 10 and 20 percent of the market share there. I'm not so sure about that. Um, is that going to be enterprise only? Is it going to be? I mean, we're, now we're going into Android, BlackBerry. Uh, obviously iOS and a Microsoft based tablets they're kind of in fourth place in the phone department or 10 to 20 percent you guys buying that why no why not I mean if Microsoft actually gets its head into the game and gets things working right they they definitely could do could get a large part of the enterprise business and I think that in the past few months let's say since the development of Windows 7, they have been doing everything right. And it's not super ultra exciting, even though, you know, Windows Phone 7 is, is, is getting pretty good reviews, but it's, it's sort of to be commended that they have finally, let's look at Microsoft, you know, maybe three or four years ago with Windows uh, Vista, everyone was piling on them and now they're getting praises left and right. And I think that has to be to start paying off at one point, 10, 20%, okay. why not? But one thing I would I would counter there is that I see tablets as leisure devices. They're not the best productivity tools. Yeah. So this is sort well, of, they yeah, can yes. either go big or go home. Either they're just not designed for productivity, so what the hell is Microsoft trying to get into this business for anyways, or Microsoft's actually going to do a good job and make the tablet a productivity tool. Yeah, uh -huh. why not? I mean, the, the, the iPad was not, I'm, I'm sorry, I mean, the tablet was not even a leisure device or anything until, you know, Apple came out with the iPad. There's no reason why Microsoft couldn't come out with a tablet that makes it usable in a productivity environment. Mm, I don't know. They're going to have to bring the stylus back. And I think we did that in 2001. Yeah. It, it didn't we work. Did, we've been... We've been doing tablets for years and years. It didn't work. It doesn't mean that it is uh, destined not to work forever. I'm imagining yeah. a Microsoft keynote at CES with mm. Steve Ballmer walking on stage while guest star Justin Timberlake sings, I'm bringing stylus back. <laughs> <laughs> bringing stylus back. Ooh. I got mine right here. It's an old Sharpie. There you go. Uh, I'm feeling also, it. Also, our second of three Microsoft stories, more than 1.5 million Windows Phone 7s sold to date. That means 1.5 million Windows phones were shipped to stores, not that you bought them. There's um, no mention sure? there of 1.5 million phones being activated. So this yeah. is a little bit dubious in terms of what are the actual penetration numbers for the Windows Phone 7 actual consumers. Uh, let's, uh -huh. let's, let's, I'm going to be positive here. 1.5 million shipped is actually a very good number, even if, they, if not every one of those is sold. Because it's not like the book business where all the books sit in the warehouse. Robert Scoble made a very good article today ex explaining why this isn't sales. But he used the book analogy, and it's a little different there because you can have books sit in a warehouse and then return them to the publisher and they get mulched, that's not going to happen with Windows Phone 7. Carriers are not going to order a bunch of Windows phones if they don't think they're going to sell them. So I, I do think that even though this isn't as good of a number as maybe Microsoft's trying to spin it, uh, it does mean that Windows Phone 7 has interest. It's, it's in the early days, but it's taking off. I, it's crucial what kind of new devices they get out on the platform next year and what kind of features they add to it in the, in the firmware updates. A couple of um, conflicting data points here. So uh, it took the original iPhone 74 days to hit a million units sold back in 2007. So that says, oh, okay, well, maybe Windows Phone 7 is gaining actual, momentum. Actual retail sales, not shipped, because Apple was the only one selling them. True. But here's the thing that really counters this number is that Google says they're activating 300,000 phones a day. Well, so, yeah, but they're on like, you know, more than a dozen devices now. So that's that's a that's a whole different ballgame. They're way up on that curve farther down in months. The early days of, of the first T-Mobile G1, they weren't activating 300,000 a day. 
No, fair enough. But I think we're also looking at unprecedented smartphone penetration and growth. And so if Windows Phone 7 was going to get a leapfrog effect from just the general, you know, a rising tide raises all boats, then you would think that they would be moving at a faster pace. Enough said. Well, let's throw the numbers of, okay. our, of our third story in before I, and then we'll hear what you want to say, Patrick. Uh, IDC analysts say they're impressed with the rate at which Windows Phone Marketplace has been adding applications. The marketplace isn't a direct measurement, but it's an indication. Uh, Windows 7 Marketplace reaching 4,000 apps two months after launch, uh, one of the most rapid ramp-ups in recent times, reaching this milestone faster than Android, which took from October 2008 to March 2009 to reach the same level. And what I wanted to say is that we want to root for Windows and be happy for Windows Phone 7. And Becky, you're sort of ruining it. So, yeah, that's not be cool. <laughs> Does that help you out? I was a Francophile before this podcast. I was, really. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, how, how weird is it that we're now having to root for Microsoft? A and little that, underdog. Think, isn't it? it, and, it and we're genuinely, a lot of us, I think, in the tech community are feeling like Microsoft is, is this underdog that's trying to overcome the, the hegemony of, of Apple and others. And it's very strange. And, and um, I don't know. It, are you it, saying you get a little, sort of, a little whiff of palm off of Microsoft? For you, of palm? No, not really. Okay, um, not that bad. No, 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 That's not that bad. No, no. All right. <laughs> but still, no. I think that these are you know good numbers, and uh, the the early early few days of the Windows Phone release was smelled very very bad. It was like we were hearing forty thousand uh, phones uh, sold worldwide, which was horrendous. Uh, I think you know it's going somewhere, and as everyone is saying, Microsoft has. Uh, breath. You know, they can take this thing for months and years and the long run, and they have to be present on this market, and they will. So we're, we shouldn't count them out, even if they don't sell, you know, even if they only sell 40,000 in, in three months. All right, let's uh, take a quick break. Thank our sponsor, Slingbox, bringing you tech news today. Just in time for the holiday, Slingbox is introducing their new iPad app. Now you can watch your home TV on your iPad anywhere you take it. Slingbox is a great holiday gift. You plug it into your television, you plug it into your internet, then you watch your TV wherever you want, wherever you have an internet connection, on your laptop, on your phone, on your iPad. You can find Slingbox or see a demo at Best Buy or check it out at Slingbox.com. Slingbox and your home TV now appearing on iPads everywhere. Where? Tune in and find out. I think this justifies the purchase of an, a Wi-Fi only iPad. It's like, hey, I'm just getting another TV and we can take it anywhere in the house. I actually that, the swing I, box. I use my, my iPad that way. Exactly. It's like adding a TV to the kitchen and the bedroom and the back room and the garage because you just carry the iPad with you. See? Yeah. yeah, but don't you ever hope or wish you could use a stylus on your TV? Wait, <laughs> no, never mind. <laughs> I can't say that I have. Uh, Sony Ericsson PlayStation phone. We got we got some rumors. In fact, we got a an email uh, from a listener who wished to remain anonymous. We will try yes. to protect you from Julian Assange as much as we can. Hello there, TNT crew. Deep throat voice. I wanted to tell you a couple of tidbits I was recently told by a friend of mine who works close to the team developing the upcoming PlayStation phone. I have no way to prove it's the fact, but God is my witness. This is what he told me. Showed the phone to me, looked more or less like the Engadget video we saw before. Uh, it's a prototype, physical layout, might turn out to be different, but he said, here are the stats. 1.2 gigahertz Qualcomm processor, uh, platform that's yet to be released, available Q1, and this is the thing our, our, uh, our leaker uh, says surprised him the most. It will not carry the PlayStation name. Apparently, it's too costly for Sony Ericsson, and Sony doesn't want to give the name up for free. Looked cool. Uh, I really like the touchpad in the middle, um, and it, he thinks it's going to be a killer device. Love the show. Uh, That's trademark our inside info. A trademark search going around bears that out. Uh, Sony Ericsson uh, filing for a trademark called PlayStation or called the uh, Sony Ericsson Xperia Play. So not a PlayStation phone, but an Xperia Play. Uh, so several blogs reporting today that that's what the PlayStation phone will be called, the Xperia Play. Turns out uh, Sony Ericsson also registered Xperia Arc, Xperia Duo, and Xperia Neo. Uh, so there's some interesting stuff there. And then uh, Pocket Lint reporting that the PlayStation phone will hit shops in April, no matter what it's called, uh, after it is launched at the Mobile World Congress in February. Yeah, no CES PlayStation phone. Boo. Yeah, no. CES <laughs> is not the place to introduce a new product. 
apparently. <laughs> Not if you want to get any press. Uh, however, if you launched a media streamer this this season, it was a good thing. Roku's CEO, the Roku maker of the little Roku box that streams Netflix, Hulu, amongst other things, says when Apple and Google made their moves, it helped them double their sales because people realized, hey, there's boxes that do these things. Can I find one that's not as limited as Apple to the Apple store? Can I find one that isn't as expensive as the Logitech review? Yes, you found the Roku, and uh, they said that's been really good for their sales. Apple isn't complaining either. They announced uh, that Apple TV has hit the 1 million sales mark this week. Yeah, it looks like this is one of the most popular gifts on uh, Amazon. They have a list of their best-selling gadgets. The Roku XD, the $80 version, is number nine on the list. Their XDS player is number 11, and then the low-end version is number 42. But Apple TV, way down the list. BoxyBox, Google TV, not competing as well at all as any of the other Roku products. Now, also on the uh, set-top box uh, front, TiVo is not going to be allowed to put Hulu Plus on the TiVos it sells to cable companies. TiVo sells boxes directly, and on those you can get Netflix streaming and Hulu, but you won't be able to get those on the TiVos sold through your local cable company because that would violate the rules uh, set down by the networks because they don't want to have you able to watch Hulu and Netflix. They want you to pay the $3 for the on-demand service through the cable company. These are the same networks that own Hulu. <laughs> can you hear me do the face bomb? It's horrendous. It's also, uh, just let me throw this in, they're not going to do a Hulu IPO because they say they can't get the long-term content negotiations they want, or at least that's the, the rumored reason for that, with the people that own them. Uh, so <laughs> instead, they're going, to they're going to look at opening up different plans, different ways of having Hulu Plus. So there would be multiple subscription plans, possibly plans that would be similar in expense and availability to the ones on the cable company DVRs. And I bet those would be allowed to be put on the TiVo. This is such a mess. Okay, I want to go back to the thing about the TiVo. At least this I can sort of understand. Let me create an analogy. And I'm playing devil's advocate before Patrick reaches out across the Atlantic and slaps me. <laughs> so here's here's the thing. With a rope. Is that <laughs> yes. If if the cable companies are subsidizing the cost of the TiVo, then I kind of can understand this. It's a little bit like the phone companies who give you these smartphones. Sure, they could run Skype over your 3G network, but uh, they want you, they've subsidized the cost of the phone, so they want you to use their minutes and their actual voice minutes. Um, I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying I understand the business justification that sure. they're making. It's not great for consumers, but it's the Wild West out there, man. That's just, and that's the bottom line. This is a mess. Well, I, but this it's kind not. Of convergence it's, is just ugly. It's it's a Wild West theme park. It's not really the Wild West because you only have one choice for your cable company, unless you go satellite. True. Fair enough. Fair enough. And then you're paying. I mean, this is the scenario. I mean, I got the satellite. I got the cable. I'm streaming the stuff. It's just, <laughs> yuck. I'm I, trying well, to advise what, consumers you know, right now. Forget about it. I understand your I understand your analogy, uh, Becky. But it, and I know you're playing devil's advocate. But it's I, I sort of see also another thing uh, that is kind of similar. It's you know the difference between Netflix and Blockbuster, right? Blockbuster. It's per perfectly understandable that they wanted to sell or to rent DVDs in their physical stores because that was their their business, and they were you know hanging on on a ship that was sinking. And now look where they they are at. And it's sort of the same thing here. I mean, everyone knows it. It doesn't really, you know, need to be repeated again. But it it's so incredibly, uh, uh, I don't want to say moronic because there are more factors in play. And it's very understandable that these huge uh, corporations can't change direction easily. But it's, it's still, as an outsider, you look at this and you see them sinking and you're screaming, you know, jump into the boat you can save yourself <laughs> just do something and they're standing on the deck you know playing with the with the 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 uh ah concert uh, band thing uh, <laughs> while they're sinking it's incredibly uh, frustrating for us well, it's the difference between looking at what Amazon has decided about their business model going from analog to digital and just, like you said, jumping in with both feet and then some of these cable companies who are just, and the content companies who just don't know which, which way to jump or if they should just stand still, frozen with apoplexy. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> that you know, is Tom we're, frozen we're with apoplexy. Really 
we're really wound, wound up for a good rant anti-content owners, right? I'm, I'm sure we're going to root for yeah, someone we, who would we, come uh, up and tell truth to power. We actually have someone to do that for us today, thanks to <laughs> um, the uh, CEO of Filmon. Filmon is the uh, site we mentioned earlier that has had a restraining order put against it because they were streaming local television broadcasts live over the internet. You could get them free if you went to Filmon on your iPad. Uh, and they have uploaded, or uh, rather Alki David, uh, the person in charge of, of Filmon, has uploaded a video posted to YouTube called CBS You Suck. <laughs> um, Subtle. This is not my personal opinion as I'm a former not, I'm not employee exactly of CBS. Sure what he means by that. I uh, don't agree with him, but he's just a little too crazy. He starts he starts off the video explaining what Filmon is and what it does. Here's a little taste of that. It's a, it's like a 9-minute video. Mean everywhere. Even when I'm driving 200 miles an hour through the streets of Beverly Hills in my red Ferrari, California. Yeah! I can watch TV in HDI from all over the world. So, no app once he's convinced you that he's a man of the people just like you, uh, <laughs> then he goes on to explain why CBS is evil because they profit off the piracy from their subsidiary. Well, CNET profits from the downloading of illegal software, DRM cracking software. I went to CNET.com and I typed out WEP in the search field. What did I get? A series of softwares that allows me to hack into people's wireless connections and into Wait, their computers. Boingo Wireless does not allow you to <laughs> hack into people's connections. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and also, Boingo. download, having worked at CNET, download.com is very, very particular about making sure that not a single piece of software goes up that in any way violates the law. <laughs> there, there's software out there that can be used for good or ill, and that's what he's talking about there. Uh, and then he finishes up in a circu circuitous logic uh, saying that because CNET has some DRM cracking software that's frankly perfectly legal on download.com, that makes CBS evil. Here's how he, here's how he finishes up. He's about to go. Come on, you done. The lot of you are a bunch of hypocritical, thieving liars. And I hope that this message gets across to you and you see how you have single-handedly destroyed the entertainment business in the 21st century. How is he going to be able to afford his Ferrari and his <laughs> classical music and his gilt frames if he's not allowed to continue to rebroadcast live television without permission? And Alky his copy David, of the Mona Lisa AK. in the in the background. That's the real Mona Lisa, by the way. The one you got in France oh, yes. is fake. <laughs> I think that um, I Alki that. David, aka Isaiah Mustafa, um, <laughs> is the he, he should have his photo next to the definition of egomaniac in the dictionary. I mean, I, I this puts ranting in a whole nother category. It is all about him. Um, but I mean, the the interesting thing is this guy, it would take someone who's crazy to, to try and make this business model work. Uh, do they have any shot in hell of making this go? Well, actually, they've done several deals with local television stations selling them the technology for their streaming, which is quite good uh, because the t TV stations saw the pirated stuff and went, wow, how do you get us to stream that great? Can we, we'd like to buy that. So I, I don't understand why he's pushing this over the edge with this nine-minute uh, video. Maybe it was like CBS owned and operated stations wouldn't uh, get on board and pay for anything. I don't know. It's obviously personal. It's very tongue-in-cheek. He's not taking himself seriously in this video. But he is trying to make a point. Uh, yes, he is trying he to get is. A, he's just trying to get attention. Yeah, I think he is. Um, I think he is seriously. taking. I mean, the the way he's waving his finger at us, I think that tells that he's taking himself very seriously. Oh no, I don't. I just I, like that I he calls less moon vest less moon vest. That's what I mean. I don't think he's actually doing that on purpose. <laughs> Maybe not. I think he's he just being a, he's being a goofy character on purpose so that people will talk about it. Well, he, I also he wins. love the we way. Are. Sorry, I, I also love the way uh, you know. I, I that's why I, what I was saying in prep. I was completely ready to. I mean, you guys have affiliations with the content owners, so people might question your your judgment of this. Even though you know, I'm sure you know it's not questionable. But I'm completely independent from all of these, and I was so ready to be 
to jump on the boat with him and say, you know, yes, you should be doing this, that, and that, and that's how it should be, and you're being uh, uh, asinine for not doing it. And then he goes into that crazy thing about that affiliate, uh, you know, on download.com, which allows you, you know, he says, guess what I found on download.com? WEP cracking software. And it's like he presents it as if it's the, the conclusion of his argument that yeah. you are, are completely convinced. And you're like, wait, what? Look at download.com. Now look at me. Now look at download.com. <laughs> now search for WEP. Now look at me. <laughs> it's it's very funny, but um, yeah, strange. <laughs> All right, uh, let's thank our other sponsor, MailRoute.info. If you need spam and virus protection for your email, uh, you can join f with one user or 50,000 users. If you're a big company or small company, MailRoute will protect you from spam and viruses, simplify your life. You edit the MX record so the mail goes to MailRoute servers. They strip out all the spam. They get rid of 90% of the crap that comes to my inbox at acedetectedsobrillant.com and made that email address usable again no false positives you get all the good stuff uh sent back to you of course you can check to look at, at the bunch of spam if you really want to see a bunch of enzyte viagra ads and make sure that nothing was in there uh but i haven't had a false positive yet keeps all the stu bad stuff out keeps the good stuff in uh and leo has been using it for years and swears by it uh nothing easier for mail filtering than mail route no hardware or software to install you just edit your record a little bit visit mailroute.info sign up as a twit listener and you'll receive a 10% discount for the life of your account. Small business accounts start at $2 per user per month. Uh, or there's a new service for individual users, less than $30 per year for single users. Visit MailRoute.info and sign up with the email filtering service that I use. Leo uses it too. Uh, and, and really, uh, if you want to get rid of some spam, if that's important, it's worth the 30 bucks a year. Absolutely. All right, let's uh, go to the news fuse. Apple banned the $1.99 WikiLeaks app from its App Store Tuesday, only 10 days after approving it on December 11th. The app provided uh, <laughs> provided a bunch of crap, really. Real-time updates from the official WikiLeaks Twitter account, which you could also get on Twitter, and <laughs> access to leaked documents, which you could also get in your web browser. Uh, and it was available for download as of December 17th. We're not sure why the app was pulled at this point. Maybe because it, it sucked. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> The SEC is looking into the abrupt departure of Mark Hurd from Hewlett Packard earlier this year and whether it was related to an alleged leak of the company's massive acquisition of EDS. The leak was allegedly made to Jody Fisher, who was a former contractor for HP. You'll remember this whole scandal, who later accused Hurd of sexual harassment. The plot thickens. This is going to be a movie someday, people. Yeah, right. The fallout from a patent dispute between Kodak and web photo site Shutterfly could embroil many online image sites, says patent experts. Kodak claims it owns patents regarding the display of online images that is being infringed by Shutterfly. The landmark case could have ramifications for other popular online photo sites such as Yahoo's Flickr and Google's Picasa. The patents cover... Images that are stored centrally and can be ordered online. Uh -oh. Patents. Man, Apple, seriously. Apple, too. Uh, Connect for Xbox 360 recognizes your arm and leg movements, so why not your finger gestures? What, what did you think I was going to do? Uh, <laughs> insiders that image and I know, right? <laughs> insiders <laughs> at Microsoft claim to be working hard on increasing the amount of data the controller's camera can transmit to the console. If they quadruple the level of detail in your movement, they imagine finger recognition for games like Guitar Hero or more responsive tickling for your connectable. And imagine how gestures could be used in something like Grand Theft Auto. Like this, like the back of your hand. Oh, sure. Just a slap Read or between something. the lines, were they... Yeah, oh, you put your fingers down. Nice boy, I thought you were. Uh, Google security engineer Nick Kralovich highlighted the relative openness of Google's new Nexus S smartphone, confirming that it provides a simple and easy way to unlock the bootloader for the purpose of installing third-party firmware. Kralovich argues that the carriers should follow Google's lead and give users legitimate unlock methods, and if they don't, consumers should demand them, I tell you. Get to the streets. <laughs> like a Frenchman. 
<laughs> That's what we do. Uh, the makers of Silverlight are helping pave the way for better HTML5 coding. Microsoft is launching a lab for emerging HTML5 specs. Aren't they set already? The site will include demo code for two cutting-edge HTML5 technologies that aren't quite finished. WebSockets and indexed DB. Microsoft plans to keep code updated for each one uh, as each one progresses on its way to becoming a stable part of the standard. Thank and you, Microsoft. While Microsoft tinkers with HTML5, Apple's got a new tool to make it easy for developers to create iAds, the company's mobile ad platform. The new iAd, pro 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 iAd producer, that's what it's called, is designed to help developers create, test, and launch mobile ad campaigns to run under iAd, freely available to any paid member of Apple's iOS developer program. So not entirely free. Uh, iAd producer runs under Mac OS 10. 10. There you go. Uh, you know the thing that kind of stinks about watching the 3D TV? All the programming? Is, yeah, the lack of programming. <laughs> it would be number one, but number two would be wearing 3D glasses in your own home. I'm sorry, I've tried to get with the program, but it's just weird. Uh, so hold tight. Toshiba says they plan to unveil glasses-free 3D TVs at CES. Mm -hmm. They'll be available for purchase by April, um, despite the fact that many analysts say audio auto stereoscopic aka glasses free 3d tv technology is still several years from being market ready uh i welcome the initiative i think that's going to be the thing in addition to the content that propels Just 3d tv forward don't get too excited about it it's there it's going to be sold but it's not going to be great yet no and i i would like to also um say one thing which is we recorded our our uh, premonitions for 2011, our predictions, and I said we will see glasses-free th uh, 3D TV. That was my prediction that I made, but I did just put the caveat in. It's still going to suck. The way this headline is written, I prefer to think that it means they're going to release larger glasses, and you'll get a free 3D, <laughs> free 3D, 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 3D TV. TV with it. So. Excellent. Yeah, that'll be fantastic. <laughs> no, there's a hyphen there. I know. All right. Uh, <laughs> finally, Harry Enfeld and Ronnie Corbett uh, do a fantastic uh, comedy show on BBC One, and they recently did a sketch which is full of puns, meaning you audio listeners are going to have to go find the video at Engadget.com or YouTube or something <laughs> if it's going to make any dang sense to you. But for the video users, and imagine you're going into a fruit shop. Okay, we'll just set that up for the audio users. Here you go. I bought something from you last week, and I'm very disappointed. Oh, yeah? What's the problem? Yeah, well, my Blackberry is not working. <laughs> It's a piece of fruit, an actual blackberry. The man has What's placed the run out of juice. actual blackberry on the counter. Oh, no, it's completely frozen. <laughs> oh, yeah, I can see that. I'll tell you what. <laughs> Let's try it on Orange. Orange is a telecommunications provider in England. That's got a few black spots, you see. Oh, dear, yeah. So he Sorry actually put the yeah. blackberry on an orange. Well, All right, we'll push it for you. Yeah, 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 exactly. So there you go. That's that's a uh, that's a bit of the clip. The it goes on for a couple more minutes, but it's a fantastically hilarious uh, pun fest. Of obviously they'll get into Apple. You know that's coming, right? You know, and it At does first, create the paradigm and the analogy for if only we accepted as much uh, trouble and difficulty with the other products we purchase in our life what, as we like do fruit? with technology. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's take a look at the calendar. Two, two, two. All right, Nintendo's going to reveal 3DS details on January 19th. Uh, we know that Japan is getting the 3DS on February 26th. So the question, will the great white North America be too far behind? Uh, you know, it sounds like mid-March release is what people are expecting here in the U.S. The great uh, white North America? You're just well, talking about Canada? <laughs> I don't know what happened. I was thinking or were you, like... <laughs> Like 1950s. <laughs> we were all hoping you would let it. You would let it slide, Tom, and you had to. Listen, just I'm from the non-contiguous America, so this whole continent confuses me. Right, okay. Right. 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 I understand. <laughs> you know, uh, it's Central South people. Whatever. All right. Go, go take a little <laughs> surf vacation. Uh, I'll handle the next one. Minecraft is entering beta, the uh, popular uh, game amongst uh, folks where you move blocks around and then they get destroyed by zombies, uh, is now 14 euros 95 uh, and is available in an actual official beta. It's out of alpha. 
Uh, following up on a story that we talked about a few months ago, uh, Intel acquiring the security company McAfee, and there was a lot of um, speculation on why they were going to be doing that. Was it because they were interested in creating security for in-car um, systems? Is it because they were seeing a rise in uh, virus on chip outbreaks, which we did hear a little bit more about? But the update is that U.S. regulators have approved the acquisition, uh, still has to go over to that other continent where Patrick is, I'm not sure which one that is, but they, they have to deal with that. Uh, but it is approved It's the here. great white north of Europe. That's yes, this, it is this week. <laughs> um, <laughs> and finally, the Facebook Hacker Cup is open for registration. Uh, there are a bunch of prizes here. And basically what's going on, this is their international coding competition. Three online rounds and a final round that will be held at Facebook headquarters. Uh, your chance to compete against the world's best programmers and win the title of world champion. And the awesome prizes, first prize is $5,000. All right, a couple quick emails before we wrap up here. Uh, first one from Braden says, you might be interested to know that John Dvorak and Adam Curry's blogs are both blocked at NASA, in addition to the <laughs> ones that your caller listed yesterday. Um, See? Yeah. That's just furthering their conspiracy theories right then and there. Uh, this one is from Troy Peterson. He says, this is fascinating. This is why the Kindle crashes. Once a bit of paint has rubbed off of the hooks on this, um, you can see I'm holding this fantastic case here that uh, gives you a light. We so talked there's about some this. Black, uh, black paint on the hooks that it, that it attaches to, right? That's right. And once the paint rubs off, uh, power starts actually flowing through the cover. Wow. I'm not being um, shocked right now. And that gives it basically a brownout. The CPU doesn't get enough juice to operate properly, and it gets hung or reboots. Um, really good explanation of that at Connectify. Um, and thank you, Troy Peterson, for sending that in. All right. And thank you, Patrick Beja, for being on the show. It's always great to have your perspective in all seriousness, man. I really like the, the fact that you're willing to do this. Thank you so much. I'm really uh, appreciative of the fact that you're willing to have me on the show, even uh, though I've been on before. Let uh, <laughs> let folks know. Well, I'm, I'm, I mean, you repeatedly keep coming back for the abuse. It's kind of impressive. <laughs> I don't know. I think I'm the one that got abused around here. I'm not so sure Beja comes back. <laughs> and I would like to formally apologize to <laughs> Becky and the entirety of the Great White North for that uh, <laughs> episode today. Uh, um, yeah, Patrick, yes, let people they know where can, they can find you. People can find me at patrickbeja.com or if they like French and French language podcasts, go to nowatch.net and you'll find a host of uh, audio and video podcasts there. Only two more Tech News Todays left before Christmas. So check us out tomorrow. We'll be back. Twit.tv slash TNT is our website. TNT at twit.tv is our email address. And uh, hey, nobody called yesterday. Well, actually, a few people called, but nothing we could play. So give us a call, will you? 360 TNT Show. Keep it less than 30 seconds. Make a good point. Maybe it's about net neutrality. See you tomorrow. Bye. Oh, nice gesture, Tom.